Hello, welcome back to The Effect, and specifically the final video in this series on The Effect, at least until I decide to add some bonus ones. We'll see whether or not that happens. At least right now, I'm feeling pretty done. So, as long as the world is uh, burning and everything is wrong, we might as well make it a little bit worse, and let's talk about just a bunch of different stuff that could be going wrong in your analysis that we don't like to talk about to close out our Under the Rug chapter. So in this video, I'm just going to breeze through a couple of different assumptions that you are making, uh, but might not realize it and could be messing things up. The first is SUTVA, the Stable Unit Treatment Value Assumption. Uh, this is basically the idea that we know what treatment actually means, or at least that's one way that you can interpret it. So SUTVA is an assumption that says that uh, the treatment that we are estimating uh, is the treatment on the individual that we are estimating it on, which sounds a bit circular, uh, but you can sort of think about it as saying that there's no spillover effect. So let's say that I'm looking at the effect of a tutoring program on your kid's grades. Now, let's say I randomize tutoring to either, uh, you either get tutoring or tutoring or not, it's completely random, and there's there should be no back doors, and we are good to go. But what if uh, your kid being tutored, um, you know, they sort of also pass along a couple of tips and tricks to the their friends who they study with? Well, in that case, the effect of tutoring is really, you know, it's got some spillover effects. So being treated uh, is being treated and not being treated might also mean being treated, but just a little bit. Well, if we just look at the effect in our data, then we will be sort of mixing up those two things, right? The untreated population is treated a little bit. Uh, and as long as there's these sort of spillovers, then we might not be able to get the effect that we want, right? We're going to be mixing up different things. Uh, and this is a very simplified representation of Sutva. I would look at maybe a more technical demonstration if you're interested, but this is a, you can sort of narrow it down to that. Now, there are some ways that we can get around Sutva. Uh, one of those might be defining your treatment area broadly enough so that you think that there aren't spillovers. So, for example, if you think that uh, this tutoring program might have spillovers between friends in the same classroom, uh, but probably not going to bleed over between classrooms, well, maybe instead of looking at the effect of tutoring on an individual student, you look at the effect of the share of students who are tutored within individual classrooms. Maybe you can redefine treatment in that way such that you know what treatment actually is, right? A single student being treated, you don't know what that actually is because that treatment might actually apply to other people as well. But the share of students in a classroom getting treated, if that really only affects students in that classroom, then you at least know what treatment is in that case. So that is Sutva, and it is the terror of many a causal inference researcher, but that is not the only one. Next is model uncertainty. Uh, we have done a whole lot in this book to try to say, make sure you know what your model is. Write down your model of the real world. We're going to use that model to try to build your research design and therefore the actual estimate that you will produce. Great. We're doing theorizing. We're thinking carefully about where all our data comes from. But once you start actually doing this, you realize that there are a lot of decisions that you have to make that you might not be 100% certain about either way. And so the actual model that we end up with, we shouldn't be perfectly certain is the actual correct model that we should be using. So what do we do? Well, uh, that leads us to model uncertainty. We don't know whether the actual model that we are using is the correct one. And this doesn't come down to sampling variation. This comes down to simply not, you know, there are many different models you could have run. Maybe one of them is right, but you don't necessarily know exactly which one is actually right. There are some decisions that you had to make based on imperfect information, but you had to go with something. Now, when you have this case, and there, we often are uncertain about our model, there are some things that you can do. You could just try a bunch of different models. For example, in the simplest version of model uncertainty, we're just not certain exactly which control variables we need to include. And that's an easy problem to fix. Just try running all the control variables. Try a model with this control variable, without this control variable. Try it with this one, without that one, with this one. Try all the different combinations. You know, if you got 10 different control variables, that's only what, two to the power 10 different models? Maybe you can prune it down a little bit to make it simpler, but you can run, you know, a few hundred different models and average things together. Now that is an easy approach to take if the model uncertainty that you have is about which control variables to include. And in that case, you get nice little things called specification diagrams where you can see the distribution of the effect that you estimate across all these different control choices. And you can get a better idea of what your actual estimate might look like if you had known what the correct set of parameters were. Now, there are other forms of model uncertainty that are not quite as easy to fix. Things like, is this variable a collider or not that's going to mess things up? Things like, uh, hey, am I leaving something out entirely? Is there a control that needs to be in here that I didn't even think about that is not in my data? Uh, lots of stuff like that. In that case, we are still uncertain about our model, but we can't just sort of simulate our way out of it by trying a bunch of different stuff. And that's always going to be the case. We are not going to be completely 100% certain about our model ever. Uh, and that is going to plague our dreams. Next up are non-existent moments and power laws. Now, a lot of the methods, almost all the methods that we've been using in this uh, in this book, 
are about estimating means, almost entirely. Even when it doesn't seem like they're estimating means, that's still sort of what they are doing, or at least moments. They're estimating moments. And what a moment is in statistics, a mean is an example of a moment, so is the variance, the skewness. Uh, it is a, a statistic based on the distribution of your variable that has to do with a sort of central tendency uh, with the areas to a certain power. But our estimates have been all about those moments. Now, the problem with this is that some distribution, some variables are distributed in such a way that they literally do not have those moments. It is possible to have a variable that does not have an expectation. It does not have, I mean, it has a mean. If you pick a sample of data, you can calculate the mean. Nothing can stop you from doing that. But that mean is not actually estimating any real part of the distribution. Now, when that happens, when you have a distribution that does not have a, a, a first moment, a mean, really, in, in its theoretical distribution, then when you get a sample, the mean is going to jump around sharply from sample to sample, right? Typically, what we'd expect is that the mean is going to be normally distributed over different samples. And so it's going to be pretty, pretty well behaved. We're probably going to get pretty close to the actual mean, maybe in different samples, it'll be a bit above, a bit of below. Um, but if the mean does not exist, well, then, uh, you know, we're going to get very different estimates from sample to sample. And any given sample that we have is not really going to tell us all that much about the overlying data. So we can't infer that much from it. The way in which this comes up most often is in the case of fat tailed distributions. If you have a variable uh, that has a fat tail, uh, then often it will not have a mean. It will not have a first moment. What do I mean by a fat tail? Uh, a fat tail is any distribution where a lot of the data is concentrated in one area, but there's also a, but there's also a bunch of really, really big outliers, right? And now a lot of different distributions have really big outliers, right? In a normal distribution, uh, technically that has an infinite range. You could have a normal distribution centered around zero with a standard deviation of one, and it is theoretically possible to get a value of one billion, even though it's going to happen a vanishingly small portion of the time. The difference with fat tails is not just are those values possible, but they happen a lot. These are the common values, but these very, very big outliers, they happen pretty regularly. A great example of this is something like income. A lot of people are centered right around uh, this sort of area where maybe your income is like $40,000, $50,000. Um, but there are a lot of people who make way, 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 way more than that, right? There's plenty of millionaires and billionaires in the world making millions of dollars every single year, right? It's not as rare as you'd expect it to be based on the normal distribution or something like that, right? You can get even more extreme distributions than that. So for example, a lot of popularity distributions are even more fat-tailed than that. Let's take music, for example. Uh, if you look at the top streamed artists on uh, Spotify, you can find that, uh, at least when I looked at the data, uh, Ed Sheeran was number one. Ed Sheeran had 78.7 .7 million followers on Spotify when I checked the data. Now this is 29% bigger than the number two spot, uh, which is Ariana Grande with 61 million. That is a big drop from first place to second place, a 29% drop. Uh, the 20th most followed person on Spotify is Alan Walker, who has 27.9 million. That means that the number one spot is 281% as large as the 20th spot. We lost more than half of our followers going from first place to 20th place. That's big. That's even a bigger difference than, you know, in income or wealth. The wealthiest person in the world is not three times as wealthy as the second wealthiest person in the world, which means that this music thing is a big fat tail. Now let's compare this to a distribution that does not have a fat tail, running 1500 meters. Uh, the fastest time ever recorded for running 1500 meters is 3 minutes and 26 seconds. The second place is 3 minutes and 26.34 seconds. This is a difference of 0.16% as opposed to the 29% drop from first place to second place for Spotify. Put that in another perspective, uh, imagine that you timed me running a mile. Now I could run a mile, but I am not a particularly fast man. I could maybe run a mile, I haven't timed myself recently, but let's say 6 minutes, right? That is not even twice as long as it would take the first place runner. So going from first place to me, and I got to be in like billionth place at best, uh, would would only be a difference of about 100%. Compare that to going from uh, Ed Sheeran to Alan Walker, which is just first place to 20th percent and is more of a percentage different than that. If I started a band and got a thousand followers on Spotify, which would be pretty darn successful, I would be way, way, I would be billions of times less successful than Ed Sheeran as opposed to me running a mile, in which case I'm only half as good as the number one person of all time. That's a big difference in just how skewed the top values are. Now, in both of these cases, when we have these fat tails, it just makes all of our methods not work very well. Now, if we're lucky, sometimes we can just fix the problem by taking the logarithm of the highly skewed fat tailed variable. 
Uh, and this is the application that a lot of people will try to do. If they have something that's very skewed, they'll just take the log of it and proceed as normal. However, some variables are even too skewed for that. They have too fat of tails. Things like maybe uh, financial returns over the long period might have such tails that are so fat uh, that it, even the logarithm is not quite enough to really tame it down. That is another problem we might run into. Lastly, let's close everything out with the treatment mystery. So a lot of the different methods that we have for causal inference are all about finding comparable groups. I want to compare people who are as similar as possible, except that one of them got treated and one of them didn't. We do this explicitly when we do matching. That's sort of what we're inherently doing when we do regression and we add controls. Uh, it's what we're doing with difference and differences. We want to compare a treated group to a similar control group that didn't get treated. But then the question comes, well, if they're so similar, why was one treated and the other one wasn't? That's a mystery, right? Uh, now, sometimes it is obvious, right? If we have a situation where we really understand the reason why people got treated very well, then maybe we know the answer to that question. It's like regression discontinuity, for example. I know why these two similar people got treated, one of them got treated and one of them didn't. It's because one of them was just barely high enough on the running variable and one of them was just barely too low. I can answer the treatment mystery in that case. But if I'm doing something like trying to use control variables uh, or something like that, or controlling away unobserved variation, like a fixed effects or difference in differences, I have to ask myself, if I really do think that these two groups are so similar, why did one get treated and the other didn't? A great example of this is in twin studies. One common backdoor variable that we have in a lot of different social science problems is genetics, right? Your genetics is gonna influence a lot of things about you uh, that we might consider treatments, and also a lot of things about you that we might consider outcomes. Let's say that we're interested in the effect of education on earnings, and we're like, well, you know, your genetics might make you do better in school, they also might make you earn more later in life. One way that people adjust for this is by using twins. If you get a set of twins, then you find, you find a set of twins, one of whom got more education than the other, then you can say, hey, their genetics are the same, so whatever difference I see is probably because of the education. Then you have to wonder, wait a minute, if I think that they're so similar and comparable, why did one of them get more education than the other, right? Maybe they're not so comparable. Maybe they have the same genetics, but something really different happened to one of them as a kid, and that's the thing that's driving their income, not the education. So if you don't really understand where your treatment assignment comes from, and you're just using data to try to ferret out a good comparison, you have to always wonder, well, if I think they're so comparable, why aren't they the same? That's the real question of the treatment mystery. All right, hopefully I have scared you enough uh, to put a nice little bow on all these videos. And that is it. That is the end of this series of videos on the effect. Uh, maybe there'll be more in the future, but I'm certainly not planning to do any more right now. I am done. I'm going to sleep. Good night.